It's around midnight, July 10th, 2001, a winter's night in the Sydney suburb of North Ryde. Help me! 20-year-old Seth Gonzalez runs out of his family home in a panic and crosses to the home of his neighbour, John Atamian. Hi, John! Help me! My parents have just been shot. It's in. Oh, it's in. It's shot. What do you mean your family's been shot? Seth pleads with him to help save his family, but John resists. From next door, plumber Shane Hanley hears the screaming. Someone shot my family. My parents have been shot. What do you mean shot? What do you mean shot? They're all dead. I didn't hear any shots. They're just being shot. And uh, Seth was saying, uh, my family's dead. They've, they've all been shot. And uh, that sort of took me by surprise. And uh, it uh, took a while to sort of let that sink in. Seth, what happened? Oh, gosh, What's he talking about? Is he making any sense? There were two guys under him. I tried to chase them, but I couldn't get up to them. But my family... Shane hears Seth say something about seeing chased... some men and chasing them. They ran down the street and he chased them, but he couldn't catch them. I remember looking, looking down there, hoping there wasn't someone looking back. But... Have you called the police? Seth? Seth? Have you... We've got to get someone. We've got to get all oh, the police. Wait, wait, get the police. I'll call an ambulance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seth, Seth, come. You can't go back. John ended up going inside to ring up uh, the emergency services, and, and I was outside trying to calm down Seth, uh, which was pretty hard. We eventually ended up in f up the driveway and in front of the driveway, and uh, I finally got it, Seth calmed down enough to sit him down on the ground. What happened? John, tell me what happened. <laughs> I know CPR. I know CPR. You can't come, Seth. And with that, we. Ran straight into the house. Papa! Papa! By the time Shane gets inside, Seth is Papa. kneeling over the body of 46 year old Seth, Teddy Gonzalez. Seth, Wait. Papa! He's gone. Papa! No. Papa! Seth! Papa. As I pulled Seth up, he, he turned and said, Mommy, 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 and ran around the corner, and I followed him to where Seth's mother was on the floor. Mama! Come to me, man! Mama! 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 No, Seth, leave me. Mama! Mama! Please, please, mate, mate. Seth jumped down and he started pulling at his mother, calling out, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. Mama! Seth, you've got to leave them, mate. Mama! Seth. Again, Mama. Shane pulled Seth away but he breaks free and runs back to his father. Papa! 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 can't do anything. Papa! He takes hold of the hysterical Seth and leads him outside, where John is waiting for help to arrive. Uh, then I ran straight in my, my place to ring up Triple O to make sure I rang the police. And from there I sat on the, on the uh, phone with the triple O operator until I could hear all the sirens arrive. The police aren't sure how many people are lying dead or injured and whether there are killers still hiding inside. A police sergeant and a senior ambulance paramedic enter the darkened house. The sergeant sees Teddy's body and draws his gun. And um, while he 
took a protective position over the top of me. I, um, I reached down and checked for a carotid pulse and checked for um, any, anything to indicate life. Found no pulse. They move quietly into the darkened living room where the torchlight outlines the bloodied figure of Teddy's wife, Loiva, lying on the floor. I noticed a, a large laceration on her left throat, six, at least six centimetres long, um, cut all the major vessels of the throat, but had been inflicted after she died because there was no bleeding from those vessels or wound at all. It was absolutely clean, just an open wound. Then upstairs, they come upon the battered body of 18-year-old Claudine, lying curled up in a pool of blood. Rising up the wall above her head, stretches a smeared arc of blood. Outside, Detective Senior Constable Mick Shee of the Homicide Squad arrives and begins to secure the crime scene. Uh, my first concern was to deal with Seth. He had found three members of his family brutally murdered. Um, I didn't go into the crime scene in the early stages. I firstly just wanted to deal with the victim and the victim's family and notify other people that were involved. The dog squad is called in to search the surrounding area, especially the direction in which Seth says he chased the intruders, but they can't pick up any trail. So what constantly reminded me was how clean, clinically clean, the entire premises was, except for three slain people and the blood. And each of those persons, they hadn't been moved about. There had been limited activity. Um, it was surreal in some ways from other homicides, especially the mass killings. It was very different. With no witnesses and some puzzling contradictions already emerging, police realise immediately that they're in for a long and complex investigation. Teddy Gonzalez was born in Baguio City in the northern mountains of the Philippines. He grew up in a poor family and developed a driving ambition to succeed, which saw him excel at his schoolwork and later at university. In his early 20s, he met the beautiful Loiva Claridadis and fell instantly in love. During the courtship between Teddy and Loiva then, I remember I was always waiting for him to arrive. I was about 11 then when um, during the courtship stage and I was very observant. He, he was really in love with Loiva, really. Um, and he's, he's a very romantic kind of guy. The couple married in 1978, soon had two children. First came a son, Seth, and then a daughter, Claudine. Teddy worked hard and used his savings to build a hotel in which the family also had their home. In 1990, a massive earthquake struck the city, killing a thousand people and destroying the hotel. Teddy, Loiva and Claudine escaped injury, but nine-year-old Seth was trapped in the rubble. He had his um, leg pinned under a beam and his father out the front of the hotel seeing his son was missing actually crawled through the rubble and the dust and the debris to rescue his son. Faced with starting all over again, Teddy decided to emigrate to Australia where members of Loiva's family had already settled. In 1993, after further studies, he set up business as an immigration lawyer in Sydney. The children are encouraged to work hard at school. Teddy especially expects big things of his son, Seth, and pressures him to study hard. Daughter Claudine is a favorite among relatives, a warm and generous girl who always thinks first of others.
In December 2000, after years of hard work, the Gonzales moved into a large home in North Ryde. Just seven months later, on July 10, 2001, that home became the scene of their terrible and violent deaths. A special police unit called Task Force Tarwaz is formed to coordinate the investigation into the murders. I had a multidiscipline team in that um, because we had a, an Asian family involved uh, in this incident. Uh, we had two members of the uh, Asian crime squad to work uh, on the investigation with us. Forensic investigators descend on the house and begin to gather the physical evidence from the scene. It appears the attackers had conducted some sort of search. Interesting upstairs in all the, the bedroom, in Seth's room and in the spare bedroom, I remember that the doors of the cupboards were open. Um, everything inside the cupboards was in, neatly in place and folded. It actually looked like part of a shop in, in there. It was that neat, but nothing was out of place. So it seemed that at the time we thought a, lot, a long time about why the doors were open. And you, would, you would have expected that everything would have been tipped out on the floor if people were actually looking for money or valuables. Next to Teddy's body are his car keys and his briefcase, which lies open with papers spilled out. Then there was uh, blood spilt onto the, uh, the ceramic tile floor uh, and evidence uh, or signs of a struggle there with uh, uh, movement of uh, shoes in blood and uh, some footprints or shoe prints in, in blood. Curiously, when the briefcase is lifted from its resting place beside his body, there's blood underneath. Our forensic evidence later led to the fact that the, something had happened with the suitcase afterwards, after the killing, after, after uh, Ted had been stabbed, after he died. So something had been, whether it's staged or some movement had occurred with the briefcase. The contents of Loiva's handbag are similarly spilled next to the body and also have blood underneath them. In the room where Claudine was killed, curved indents have been bashed into the wall by a club or bat. Then I was taken downstairs to a hallway near the kitchen and written in graffiti across the wall with some words. That was starkly different to everything else. Like, you have three people murdered, then you've got cheap graffiti on a wall. It wasn't consistent with the other homicides I've attended previously. A damaged fly screen is found to have been removed from a kitchen window, which is open. A forensic test later showed that that, uh, that, that fly screen was probably ripped as opposed to, and probably not uh, cut in, the, in its actually location. It was probably taken off and cut later. And it was explained by the examiners that that also wasn't consistent with the normal method of entry into a premises, a false entry into a break and enter. There's no sign of a likely murder weapon, but two knives are missing from a knife block in the kitchen. Uh, there'd been blunt force trauma to the uh, daughter, which what appeared to be a bat. Uh, there was none of those implements uh, to be found at the crime scene or in the nearby vicinity. Police begin calling on neighbours and Teddy's staff and business associates, seeking to find anyone who might provide some leads. There was a large amount of material which had to be reviewed, a large amount of computers in the premises that we spent a lot of time downloading and looking at what um, threats may have been received by members of the family via the computers. Investigators take statements from Seth and other key members of the Gonzales family. Can we just, can no, we just no, get no, an appeal, no, no, Seth? No, can we get an appeal, Seth, for anyone who knows what's happened? Is there anything you'd like to say? Post-mortems are conducted on the bodies, detailing the injuries to each and estimating the time of death. As well as the massive body wounds to all three victims, there are clear signs on Teddy's hands and arms that he tried to fight off the attack. 
Loiva's hands also show that she put up a fight, but Claudine's body shows no sign of a struggle. The investigations and the post-mortem established that the family was killed between 4 and 7 p.m. Detectives now access various phone records for each family member. At around 10 past 4, Claudine, who was alone in the house, sent a text message to a friend asking about a recent party. She was attacked soon afterwards. There are also clues that Loiva was set upon when she arrived home at around 5.30. There was a receipt there with a bag, and in that receipt was for items purchased uh, at Blacktown at uh, 16, 14 hours, so quarter past four in the afternoon of that day, which was the pursuit of the murder. She was at Blacktown, so that gave us a time reference for her killing. There's then another gap of about 90 minutes before Teddy was attacked as he came through the door at around 7 p.m. This time is calculated from his comparative body temperature. Hello, I'm home. So working out that Claudine and Mrs. Gonzalez had lower body temperatures than Mr. Gonzalez gave us a clue, and I think an important clue, that their deaths were considerably earlier in the piece than Mr. Gonzalez. <laughs> A few days after the murders, Seth is taken back to the house and asked to reenact how he discovered the bodies. He tells police how he left his father's office in the late afternoon and drove over to the North Ride home, pulling into the carport beside the closed garage at about 6 p.m. Okay. Seth says because it was raining, he stayed in his car talking to a friend on the phone. He called the home phone, and when no one answered, he drove off. Seth drove to see a friend, but couldn't locate his new home. So, as arranged, he picked up another friend, and the pair had dinner in the city. He then dropped his friend at home. It was about 11.30 when Seth got back to North Ride and discovered the bodies. Can I just get you to go through and, and somewhat detail what you did at that time? I went friends to him, I nailed down. And um, an operator answered me straight away, and um, I said that I needed um, an ambulance. Again, I, I realise it's very difficult for you. If you do want to suspend any time, just indicate that. I noticed something in the in the in the living room in the in the, in the couch here. We can suspend temporarily and recommence when you feel right. Okay. Continue. Yeah. Okay. Another to be interviewed is Loiva's sister, Emily Luna. She tells detectives that she called at the Gonzales' home around 6 p.m. on the day of the murders, but got no answer when she rang the doorbell. With no sign of anyone at home, she left. Once all the evidence has been examined and interviews completed, the detectives start to consider various scenarios for the murders. I, I don't know what the motive was, but all I can say is that um, Mr. Gonzalez's wallet was still there and there was quite a degree of cash in the wallet. So if robbery was a motive, uh, I don't think there was any evidence for it in this particular case. Since money was not a motive, detectives must then consider that the killings are some sort of hate crime. Seth tells detectives about a recent road rage incident in which his family was abused and briefly followed by a car full of thugs. The driver of the vehicle drove past them not far from their house and yelled out an anti-Asian comment before speeding away. <laughs> when you look at the timings, that all three people were killed at different times. So if the picture emerged, for me was this was a crime that was planned. I suppose most notably about the crime scene was the massive amount of overkill as we call it, that the injuries sustained by all three were well in excess to have killed them. Um, normally it's an indicator of an interfamilial killing and normally it's an indicator of a killing which expresses a large amount of emotion and normally someone close to the family.
But if you were to picture the four corners of the world, in my world, we were the four. My family, friends, and myself would like to ask anyone out there to please help us. There's no doubt that he was considered a person which had some uh, questions that need to be asked. With a better estimate now available on the time of each death, detectives notice a discrepancy in Seth's original account of finding his sister on the night of the murder. But there was definitely blood coming from that area. And somehow I assumed in my head that her heart's still beating somehow. Because he said that he uh, gave uh, CPR to her in an attempt to revive her. And it was only later on when the post-mortems were conducted that they realised that Claudine would have been dead hours before. And there was no possibility that she was bleeding or any opportunity to revive her. Another part of Seth's story they have trouble believing is that he disturbed an intruder in the house. And we also carried out a, uh, a, like a, a time frame study to have one of the investigators go down the stairs, out through the internal door into the garage, lift the, the lift door for the external door of the garage, and by the time you did that, someone out the front gate, out that side gate would have been long gone. But he maintained that he'd seen the figure of a person or two people running around the corner. The police also find a link between Seth and some unidentified bloody shoe prints found at the murder scene. During the search of um, Seth's room, um, I noticed this shoe box on the floor of his cupboard. And that shoe box was of interest because of the shoe prints that had been developed during the uh, examination. Police purchase an identical shoe to the brand and size on the box and find it matches perfectly the stranger's shoe prints found at the crime scene. The men of Task Force Tarwas decide it's time to call Seth in for some further questioning, but not before he attracts nationwide sympathy when he concludes the eulogy at his family's funeral by breaking into song. Papa, Mama, you there? Sorry, I never told you All I wanted to say And then I thought to myself, oh my God, is he crazy or what? <laughs> you know, like, I mean, honestly, I'm sorry to say this, but yeah, I just thought it's crazy. And I know Eventually, we'll be together One sweet day Palataya, ang ating Panginoon po ang sasagot ng lahat ng iyan. Despite the wide sympathy for Seth Gonzalez at his family's funeral, police are now uncovering clear signs that he may in fact be the killer. Seth's computer shows he's made extensive searches on the internet for information about poisons, and detectives find he'd obtained some seeds by mail order that are capable of being converted into a deadly toxin. It was such a strong poison that in the United States it's categorised as a weapon of mass destruction. And the, the poison is so strong that just a small amount of it can kill literally hundreds or thousands of people. Detectives then learn that a week before the murders, Seth's mother was treated briefly in hospital for what was thought to be severe food poisoning. Seth is grilled about the computer evidence. Do you want to under arrest? Yes. Police gather other evidence that Seth is an habitual and accomplished liar. Telling his friends that he just signed a multi-million dollar record deal with a music company uh, to being the world champion kickboxer that had just returned from a title fight in Brazil. He told people that he was, you know, running um, modelling companies, that he was flying to New York to um, meet up with the head of uh, cosmetic companies, that you know, 
he, he was a lawyer and he had his own condo in the city. He told me so many things, and I think this is all part of Seth's fantasy life. Teddy Gonzalez's wealth exceeds several million dollars, and now Seth is the sole heir to the fortune. At the time of the murders, Seth has very little money, but he does manage to get some $15,000 in victims' compensation for living and funeral expenses. Two months after the killings, Seth announces to relatives that he has a brain tumour. It's later discovered the story is part of a scheme to get his hands on some of his father's money to pay for a new luxury car. Within a couple of days of the deaths, Seth had gone to see the family accountant to make inquiries about how large the estate was of his parents in Australia and about how he could get access to some of it. Within a few weeks of the deaths, he'd gone to a Lexus dealer and placed an order for a Lexus sports car worth $175,000. Seth emails his godmother, who manages Teddy's rental properties in the Philippines, asking her for $190,000 for urgent medical treatment for his tumours. He even sends her documents that he's forged clearing the payment. After checking with Emily and the police, she refuses to give him any money. The police have also stopped any more victims' compensation payments. So he begins pawning his mother's jewellery and later sells his parents' cars for more than $87,000. Greed is all I can think of. Because after the incident, why would someone who just lost his family first go and see his dad's accountant a few days after the incident? Why would he drive his mom's sports car around and dress it up with new tires, new skirts, steering wheel, you know? I was asking myself, why is he going to lie if he's not, if he's innocent? He can just tell the truth. He doesn't have to lie to prove his innocence, isn't it? So that's uh, that how my doubts started. I know what I feel about him, but I have to pretend that I'm not thinking it was him. And I didn't even know who to talk to in my family because they all had mixed feelings. Evidence starts to emerge of conflicts between Seth and his parents. He'd been frequently chastised lately for his poor results at university. Another point of friction is that Seth's been a bedwetter since childhood. Um, Seth refused to see a psychologist about it. And his mother was actually quite frustrated at that. Um, and it appears that whenever he wet his bed, his parents knew his mother still did the laundry. And Claudine actually told relatives when he wet his bed. So I imagine that was quite humiliating for him and frustrating for him um, and embarrassing. Claudine then discovers Seth has been falsifying his exam results. And she tells her parents, Loiba told me that I'm just waiting for his grades to come and if he fails, then they're going to take dinner from him. And uh, after the tragedy, we used to get the mails from the mailbox and uh, we got his grades there that he failed. Maybe he, know, he knew it beforehand that he already failed. The revelations about family conflict are followed by another surprise. Emily now reveals that when she visited the house on the night of the murders, she not only saw Seth's car parked in the carport, but that there was someone moving inside the house. Is that someone? Mm -hmm.
With this new evidence and the growing inconsistencies in Seth's versions, his alibi is collapsing. But police still don't have the crucial proof that Seth was the killer. And so they arrange for an undercover officer to get close to Seth. The plan is to see if he'll give anything away about the murders. And it pays off. Towards the, uh, the end of our undercover operation and investigation, Seth was asked uh, certain, uh, certain things about the, uh, the crime. And um, at, one, at some stage, he mentioned things that only, the, uh, that only the offender would know. Task Force Tarwaz can now clearly piece together almost exactly what happened. After a tense meeting with his parents at their office, Seth arrives home in a rage at about 4 p.m. He's about to fail his exams and have his beloved car confiscated. He blames his sister for revealing all his lies to his parents. She's leaning against the wall as he takes the knife from his belt and stabs her again and again. Finally, he picks up a red sweater and throws it over her body. Now, there's no way out. He must wait for his mother and father to come home. Twenty-year-old Seth Gonzalez is a self-obsessed liar who plans to murder his entire family. Now, Seth waits patiently for his mother to come home. Police believe that Seth put on his father's jacket to stop blood getting on his clothes and gardening gloves to hide his fingerprints. A little after 5.30, he hears Loiva Gonzalez drive into the garage. As she enters the living room, Seth attacks her from behind. Then, in one final cold act, Seth bends over his mother and slits her throat. He now picks up her handbag and empties the contents beside the body. Suddenly, headlights shine outside. And then I rang the bell again because I said maybe they just didn't hear it. And then again, there was no answer. And then I had a look on the 
how would you call it, the bayside window next to the entrance door. And I was telling my son, oh, for a while I thought that was a man. It was like a shadow of a man wearing a hat, you know, and a long coat. Is that someone? No, Mum, it's a coat stand. Gerard did say that to me. Mum, it's just a coat stand, you know. I had to ring the doorbell again for the third time, and there was no answer. The thought came into my mind that um, to check on the side, because they have a side entrance as well. I decided to go towards Seb's car, which was parked on the carport, and I was thinking of going towards the side entrance of the house. But then something stopped me. Something stopped me like, oh, that's all right, I'll just ring them up tonight. So I went back to my car and drove off. Seth begins another long wait. At seven o'clock, he becomes alert as the garage door closes and his father enters the house carrying his keys and briefcase. His spinal cord is severed, but he still manages to turn and grab at the knife. No! 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 Seth drives it into his chest no, Seth! No! No! and then into his neck. Seth grabs his briefcase and carefully distributes the contents near the body. After showering, he takes a spray can of blue paint and scrawls racist graffiti on the wall at the back of the living room. To simulate a break-in, he roughly removes a fly screen from a rear window. All that's left to do now is to drive away and find somewhere to dispose of the paint can, bloodied clothes and shoes, gardening gloves and murder weapons. At 8 o'clock, he'll pick up his friend, as arranged, for a night out in the city before returning at half past 11 to raise the alarm. I called um, my sister's house just to see, you know, because we always talk, and because I didn't get to talk to them, I called them. It was busy. And I tried again, 10 minutes later, again and again, it's busy, and I thought, oh, they're using the internet. So that's why the line was busy. Now that detectives have a clear picture of events, the next move is to confront Seth about the inconsistencies in his version of events. They let him know that they can disprove his alibi, but Seth is ready for them. He changes his story and now says he caught a taxi from his home to a brothel and was with a prostitute at the time of the murders. He also enlisted the help of a taxi driver by paying him $50 and said to him that uh, and if anyone asked where I was, please uh, just tell them that I, you were giving me a lift to Chatswood. The taxi driver took that $50 thinking that he probably had a girlfriend uh, that he was trying to lie for. He was very surprised when I came knocking on his door and told him it was for a triple murder. And he was quick to say that he'd never seen Seth before in his life. As police continue their intense surveillance on Seth, 
his behavior becomes increasingly unstable. Then he makes a sinister threat, which convinces police it's time for them to move in and make the arrest. Detectives now know that Seth Gonzalez has murdered his parents and sister, but they still need hard evidence for a conviction. Seth has now changed his alibi and paid an unwitting cab driver and prostitute to back up his story that he was at a brothel at the time of the killings. But by this time, police are monitoring his phone calls and he's under constant surveillance. The investigation progresses for several more months and more of Seth's lies and erratic behavior come to light. In addition to buying deadly poisons by mail order, it's discovered that he also staged a blackmail scam. That uh, Seth had sent a letter to a food company claiming that a product had been contaminated and people would die. With no doubts, he was creating a suspect already away from himself if his mother was to die from the poisons. A picture is emerging of a cunning young man who plans to stay one step ahead of the detectives. The investigation is now a game of cat and mouse and the pressure is starting to tell on Seth. The media has also been pushing him for interviews and he finally agrees but demands a substantial payment. He then agrees to talk to reporter Cara Lawrence of Sydney's Daily Telegraph for no fee after she convinces him that selling his story would make him look greedy. He, he was meek. He, he, he behaved very meekly. Um, he, but all the time you spoke to him, you could see his eyes and his, his brain calculating. Um, the display of meekness was at odds with what you saw in his eyes and you saw his thought process and his success and you saw that he was, he was clearly um, trying to manipulate the situation to the best of his ability. Seth's next move is to pretend he's been attacked, hoping to show that he too is being hunted by killers. His story is that he was bashed and warned not to talk to the media again. When he adds that the mythical attackers also threatened to harm his extended family, worried police decide it's finally time to move in. He then started to um, lose control somewhat and, as I said, staged his own breaking in on his premises and his own abductions. And there was a veiled threat there to his grandmother as part of that abduction. We certainly had the evidence to charge, to arrest Seth, and uh, went about doing that. Seth, um, as you're well aware, you've been a suspect in relation to the murders of your mother, father and sister for some time now. Yes. Um, I want to inform you now that you're formally under arrest. In June 2002, after 11 months of painstaking investigation, Seth Gonzalez is formally charged with murder. Uh, this morning, members of Strike Force Taywaz, who have been investigating the deaths of the Gonzalez family at uh, North Ride, executed a search warrant where certain property was uh, seized. A 21-year-old uh, male person was arrested. and uh, he has been charged in relation to the uh, murders of the uh, Gonzales family, that being Teddy, Mary and Claudine Gonzales. But there'll be months of legal wrangling ahead as Seth launches a claim on his parents' estate to pay for an expensive legal team. Eventually, the claim fails, 
and in April 2004, his trial gets underway. Well, it was one of the strongest cases that I've ever prosecuted. There was so much evidence against Seth. Seth's defence crumbles when his new alibi is destroyed by the prosecution. And he attempted to create some alibi evidence by trying to convince one of the women who worked in the brothel that he had been with her that night. And there were something like over a hundred SMS messages from him to this worker at the brothel, attempting to convince her to support his alibi. Um, unbeknown to him, as it turned out, this worker was off that week. The prosecution makes a particular point about Seth's purchase and use of the rare poison. Numerous searches had been done on his computer by him for ways of killing, and he had purchased some poison seeds uh, and had used those seeds to make a poison liquid that was found in his bedroom, um, and that liquid had been used to, in an attempt to poison his mother. At one point in the trial, the jury is taken to this North Ride house, where one of the jurors notices a rare poisonous plant growing in the backyard. Seth had obviously either planted or thrown away one of his mail order seeds. The plant had grown in the 22 months since his arrest. There was further damning evidence when it's revealed traces of blue paint were found on Seth's clothes. Then there was the fact that uh, on, on his sleeve that he was wearing at the time, there was some paint that was identical to the paint that had been used to paint a message on the wall inside the house by the person who had supposedly broken into the house and killed all three of them. The jury finds Seth guilty on all counts, and he shows no emotion as he's sentenced to life. I guess it's a relief to any investigator to, to know that uh, uh, your investigation has been thorough, the evidence has been placed before the court, and a jury of his peers have found him guilty on three counts of uh, murder. And they didn't take very long um, to arrive at that decision. And uh, that was a relief uh, for the investigators and the family. The task force receives widespread praise for its work especially detectives Leonard, she, and behind the scenes, Detective Paul Orgleys. Paul was the, uh, the dark figure behind the investigation as far as Seth was concerned. He was the one that wouldn't believe Seth and was out of, going out of his way to prove his, uh, his guilt. And I, I, was, I was quite relieved that, that, that we actually got enough evidence and I was confident that we would, he would be found guilty because I, I knew he was the person who did it. And I'd known that for some time and it was quite frustrating not being able to prove it or get enough evidence to prove that. I believe that this is a shining example of how it can and should be done. Um, they withstood the pressure of public opinion. They ran it in their own time frame. They used all avenues available. They engaged uh, the killer um, so as he he believed that he could dig himself out of a hole if he kept lying, and that all went towards his guilt. In a final twist to the story, the ride house was sold, but the new owner was not informed about its gruesome past. The controversy that followed led to a new law which requires all future property sellers to disclose such a history. Seth Gonzalez was finally exposed for what he was, a ruthless and greedy man who felt nothing for anyone but himself. If my son has shot my parents, hey, please come. What? Someone's what? Yeah, someone has shot my parents. I think, no, please leave me on the floor. He's convincing himself that he didn't do it, and he wants other people to believe as well that he didn't do it. 
and eventually I guess because he's lying to everybody he's also lying to himself and so he believes his own lies maybe that makes him feel better as well I don't know maybe it makes him feel better that he believes himself that he didn't do it from a much-loved son and brother in a loving family atmosphere with opportunities and support many others never have somehow his greed led to a crime that will never be understood 